In this video, I'm going to teach you how to calculate an estimate and construct a confidence interval about the median of difference scores in a randomization test. If you have watched previous videos, you might say, I already know how to do that. I use the median of the sample as an estimate of the median of the population, and then I test all hypotheses about median difference scores using the sign test. Indeed, those methods will give you an estimate and a confidence interval about the median of different scores, but the methods we're going to look at now are based on the Wilcoxon signed rank statistic, and in the context of randomization test, these methods are preferable to those using the sign test for reasons that I'll discuss. In order to use this method, we first need to learn about Walsh averages. Let capital D sub I, I prime, be the mean of difference scores, lowercase d sub i and d sub i prime, where i is less than or equal to i prime, from 1 to 2 up to the number of observations. At this point, this statement seems quite abstract. So let's actually look at an example. I'm going to go ahead and use the values that I've used in previous videos, 3 minus 2, 7, 6, minus 1, and 12. That is, we have 6 observations. To make this quite simple, what capital D sub I I prime is, is the mean of all possible pairs of these different scores, where we take that mean only one time. The reason we do this I less than I prime is because if we did not have that rule, we would not only look at the first score compared to the second score, but would also look at the second score compared to the first score, therefore duplicating our efforts. To make this even more clear, let's go ahead and look at a table. In this table, the first column is D sub I, and let's say that the top row is D sub I prime. What we're going to do is we're going to take the average of every D sub I with D sub I prime, but only do it one time. Here I have listed in the D sub I column all six of our values in order. I have done the same thing in the first row. Now I am going to fill in this matrix by taking every row heading and every column heading and averaging them. So minus 2 and minus 2, the average is minus 2. Minus 2 and minus 1, the average is negative 1.5. Negative 2 and 3, the average is 0.5, and so on. Doing this for every possible combination of pairs, but only doing it once, which is why we only have the diagonal and the upper right side of this matrix filled in. Capital D is called a Walsh average. So here we have a collection of Walsh averages. And now I am prepared to introduce a very important estimator, the hodges lehman estimator. The hodges lehman estimator is the median of the Walsh averages. It is an unbiased estimate of the population median. That means that if we were to take many, many, many random samples from the population and for each sample calculate the hodges lehman estimator, that the average of those estimators would equal our population median because it is an unbiased estimator of the median. Also, it is a more efficient estimator than the sample median. So in a previous video, when I told you that you could use the sample median in order to estimate the population median, that is indeed true, but the hodges lehman estimator is actually a better estimate of the median. What does it mean to be more efficient? That means that when we construct a confidence interval about the population median using n observations, that this confidence interval will be narrower than if we use the sign test to construct confidence intervals about the median using the same number of observations. If the confidence interval is narrower, that means it is more informative, and if it was constructed using the same number of observations as a competing confidence interval, it is more efficient. Now that we have a better method to estimate the population median in hand, let's turn our attention to constructing a confidence interval about the population median. Whenever we construct confidence intervals using the test inversion method, the hypothesis of interest is that the parameter is equal to any value. In our case, the null hypothesis is that the median is equal to h, and the alternative hypothesis 
if we're testing for a positive treatment effect, is that the median is greater than H. And because this is an inversion test, we're going to conduct all possible tests with H being every value and then determine the set of retained values of H and that will be our confidence interval. In the randomized test design, when we do a single hypothesis test in order to determine if there is a treatment effect, we set H equal to zero and look at the different scores to see if we can determine that the median is greater than zero. But for a confidence interval, we're going to test all possible values of H. We know how to conduct the test when H equals zero. Do we know how to conduct the test when H is something other than zero? Yes, we do. We simply create adjusted scores by subtracting our hypothesized value for the median from every original score. And then we conduct the test in the normal fashion using the null hypothesis that the median equals zero, but doing this with adjusted scores. When we are doing a randomization test, it typically means that we are looking at the efficacy of the treatment, and that is why I have a one-sided alternative hypothesis, but we could optionally choose a two-sided alternative hypothesis if we were in the exploratory stages of some research and we want to obtain a two-sided confidence interval. Let's again use our sample of six observations to exemplify constructing a confidence interval for the median. Here is our chart of the possible arrangements of plus and minus signs. We have the ranks in the first row, and in the last column we have T, which is all the possibilities for the sum of the positive ranks. Given that I only have six scores, let's set our maximum type 1 error rate at 0.10, that is 10%, so that our confidence level will be 90%. If you have not already watched the previous video in which I conducted a hypothesis test about the median using these sample observations, you should go back and do so. In that video, you will find that our p-value was 0.078 because we obtained a test statistic, that is the sum of the positive ranks, of 18, and the possibility of getting 18 or greater when the null hypothesis about the median difference being zero is true, is 5 over 64. That is, the number of values that are 18 or greater divided by the number of possible sequences. What is the critical value going to be? That is, when are we going to reject the null hypothesis if we have six scores? We know we're going to reject the null hypothesis for a t of 18, but what about a t of 17? With an alpha of 0.10, we would not reject for a t of 17, because the probability of 17 or greater is 0.109. Therefore, we have determined that our rejection region is to obtain a test statistic of 18 or greater. We already tested that the median of differences is equal to zero, and we obtained a T of 18. That is, if you look at the original scores and take the ranks of those scores, ignoring the negative signs, that is considering all of these as positive values, and then if you add up the ranks of the positive scores, that is we form the ranks without regard to the negative scores, but then when we add up the ranks, we do consider which scores are negative and we skip those, we would end up with a T of 18. 18 is in our rejection region, Therefore, we will reject the null hypothesis that the difference is equal zero, and zero will not be in our confidence interval. What we put in our confidence interval are not those things we reject, we reject them, but those values that we retain. Let's try another hypothesis. How about that the median of differences is equal to one? Notice what I have done with our scores. I have adjusted them by subtracting one from each score. Now I will again rank these scores without regard to the sign of the score. What is the smallest score here? It is two, and actually, since we're ignoring the sign, there are two twos. So what do I do about that? If I was looking at the lowest two scores and there was not a tie, I would have used the ranks one and two. When there is a tie, we still use the ranks 1 and 2, but we average these ranks because they are the same score. We call that the mid-rank. So each 2 will get the mid-rank of 1 and 2, 
which would be 1.5. We've already used up the ranks 1 and 2, so now we're at the rank 3, and that will go with the score 3. It's actually a negative 3, but remember we're ignoring the negative sign. The score 5 gets a rank of 4, the score 6 gets a rank of 5, and the score 11 gets a rank of 6. Now I add up those ranks that are associated with the positive scores. That would be 1.5, 5, 4, and 6. That gives me a sum of 16.5. 16.5 is not in my rejection region, so I know that 1 is going to be in my confidence interval. What about 0.5? Let's subtract 0.5 from our original scores. That gives us these adjusted scores. Notice that the smallest of these scores, when ignoring the minus sign, is 1.5. That gets a rank of 1. Then we have 2.5, but we have that twice. So we have to take the ranks 2 and 3 and take the mid rank, which is 2.5. Give each of these 2.5s a 2.5. Now we're up to the rank of 4, and that will go with 5.5. 5. 5 goes with 6.5, and 6 goes with 11.5. Adding up the ranks that are associated with the positive scores, we add up 2.5, 5, 4, and 6, and that gives us 17.5. We're still not in the rejection region, almost, but not quite. So 0.5 is going to go into our confidence interval. We were almost in the rejection region. What would happen if we hypothesize 0 0.4? I'm going to subtract 0 0.4 from the original scores. These are my adjusted scores, and note the ranks associated with these adjusted scores. If I add up the ranks associated with the positive scores, I'm adding up 3, 5, 4, and 6, and that gives me 18. I'm now in the rejection region. Therefore, I am going to reject 0.4. I now have my confidence interval. We did not reject the value of 0.5. We did reject the value of 0.4. We are 90% confident that the median of our differences in the population is greater than or equal to 0.5. That is, the treatment is having an effect so as to shift the center of the distribution at least a half a unit in the positive direction. Do we really have to test all possible hypotheses? No, we don't. There's a shortcut, and we all like shortcuts, so let's take a look at how that works. Here again are all the possible values of t and all the possible sequences of signs. I am going to bring back our table of Walsh averages. I want to pause a moment and have you count up how many Walsh averages that we have. Did you count 21? That's correct, there are 21 Walsh averages. Notice the maximum value that t can be when we have six ranks, 21. Is that a coincidence? It is not. The number of Walsh averages will always equal the maximum value of t. It turns out that we can use that fact in order to create a shortcut for the confidence interval using Walsh averages. We take the maximum value of t, in our case 21, subtract the critical value, in our case that was 18, which gives us a value of 3. Remember that we are constructing a lower bounded confidence interval. So we start at the bottom of the Walsh averages table, if I was doing an upper bounded confidence interval, I would start at the top. And if I was doing a two-sided confidence interval, I would look at both the bottom and the top of these Walsh averages. We're going to start at the bottom because we're constructing a lower bounded confidence interval. And I am going to scratch out the smallest three Walsh averages. The smallest one is negative two, so I'm going to scratch that out. The next one is negative 1.5. I'm going to scratch that out. And the next one is negative 1. I'm going to scratch that out. All the Walsh averages that remain are going to be in our confidence interval. Which of these is smallest? That is 0.5. So we are 90% confident that the median of the difference scores in our population 
is greater than or equal to 0.5, which again means that the population has shifted at least a half a unit in the positive direction. That was a lot easier, wasn't it? There's an easier method still, and that is to use statistical software. I use R, and there's a base function in R called Wilcox.test, and one of the arguments in that function allows me to ask for a confidence interval. Another argument in the function allows me to set the confidence level that I'm interested in, and that is the easiest way of all to obtain a confidence interval.